the next group. A um, little bit about me first. I have described myself uh, as an XML geek and a standards wonk. Um, and by that I mean uh, most of my, my paid for work is working with organizations which have um, high value content. Uh, that, that would include publishers and public sector organizations and, and government as well. Um, and nearly all of my work is where that kind of content has some overlap with XML. So uh, most of the projects are turning content into high quality XML. My programming work is both for post commercial projects and um, uh, I do some open source development as well. Uh, for example, I've developed something called the Office Otron, which I believe the LibreOffice guys use for making sure that the output of their uh, tool is compliant with the standards because my other hat is as a standards wonk um, and my sins I'm involved in the mega structure which is the ISO standards world uh, in a, a body called SB34 which is a subcommittee of a subcommittee of the two parent organizations um, and in that group we are responsible for things like uh, XML schema languages you may have heard of one called RelaxNG which is uh, popular it's used for authoring the ODF schema and Schematron um, and we also are involved with other organizations in maintaining the international standards versions of a uh, number of file formats. And these include uh, both of the Office file formats. Um, ZIP, which until recently was not a standard, but was proprietary technology, um, and EPUB, and so on. So this talk is about publishing. Um, and it's going to start with this overview of what problems uh, are and how they have been addressed or tried to be addressed historically. It's about STEM publishing, and STEM is this strange acronym that stands for uh, scientific, technical, engineering, and medical content. So in other words, this is what you would call hard, uh, not just hard science, but hard published content as well. It tends to contain a full mix of things that you fear to find if you're involved in content, including mathematics, complex tables, chemistry, uh, all these things which are, are hard to deal with and present uh, in nice ways. Um, a very abstract way of thinking about what publishing is um, in this uh, uh, field is, first of all, that obviously some high value content is authored by an expert or a team of experts generally, and then that finds its way eventually to a publisher who tries to add value to what the experts produced. Um, and of course, there's, there's today a tension between experts and publishers, publishers and the experts are often saying, why are these publishers charging us to give us back the work that we've produced? Uh, and the publishers are, of course, trying to offset that and add value by enriching the, the content and making it presentable and uh, uh, nice in every single way. Eventually, when the content's been enriched to a sufficient state, the publisher can then make the products. And if it's a commercial publishing, venture, the products will be marketed and sold, and if it's free, it will be put on the web or disseminated in some other way. So that's, that's what we're talking about uh, in very abstract terms uh, for publishing. Let's try and flesh that out into a slightly more concrete set of steps. So the author produces some high-value content, and usually authors will use um, an author suite to author their, their content. There are, I mean, there are some fields where you still find uh, academics using tech, for example, to produce mathematical papers, LaTeX, more frequently. Um, but generally, it tends to be an office suite, and by far the most popular still, in my experience, is um, the MS Word is the thing that most people will tend to use to produce uh, the manuscripts. That then finds its way to the publisher, who is charged with um, adding value. And this involves all kinds of processes, so a peer review, the content needs to be checked by experts in the field. Um, COI arbitrations, as, as there are conflicts of interest and many of those involved. Um, the content often needs to be brought into line with any house standards that the publisher has, for example, style guides and standards of presentation. Um, there's whole cycles of proofing and correction where all the thing bounces around between people. Uh, the assets within the publication need to be prepared, so graphs need to be often relabeled to have the right fonts, all kinds of nasty things like that. Um, it's going to be online. People these days expect everything to be properly linked. Uh, and 
whatever the, the format, people would expect it to be presented nicely, so the presentation issue. It's worth uh, noting, although I'm calling it a publishing workflow, it's often said that the work in publishing doesn't flow. It tends to go be a sort of maelstrom of activity until it settles down into the final form. But at the end of the process, the products are still made, and that used to be print exclusively. I was talking 30 years ago. But these days, of course, it's all kinds of media in which the product is disseminated. So web, e-books, and you know, licensed content. Partners will want to take content from publishers and repurpose it in their own ways. Within the, I'll put STM there, within the world of STM publishing, standards are prevalent, have been prevalent for a very long time. Um, so the final form uh, product will, if it's print product, PDF is the standard which informs that. Um, web, of course, XHTML and its, its family of standards. More recently, if it's uh, being read on an e-reader e device or display of some kind, EPUB tends to be the, the format that's used there. For the asset itself, the digital asset, um, standards are um, things like MathML, if you're presenting, if you have mathematical content in XML, MathML is used to mark it up. Uh, graphics are TIFFs or whatever uh, other sta standards you want for graphics. And JATS is something I'm going to talk about a lot, is a standard that's used for marking up uh, STM content. In the early days of publishing, it was often the case that publishers were used, I mean, they have been used typically of going straight from author content through their workflow to concentrate on getting a PDF out. That's the version of record. That was the thing that was being sold. And so PDF was the thing that was concentrated on. And that has persi persisted for a long time with the content was put into Quark Express or whatever DTP, DTP package was favored. And the PDF was worked up into beautiful pages and then produced. Um, and of course, that model is not good if you then have to go back and produce websites and license content because you can't, as they say, turn the sausage back into the pig very easily. Um, so in the early days of publishing, these workflows were often what's called batch conversion workflows where the PDF was produced and then there was an attempt to try and work it back into a neutral asset and then out into the other formats. And this was fraught with difficulty and expense. And for that reason, something called XML first has become the holy grail of publishing workflows, even though nobody quite knows what it means. What it tends to suggest in practice is that there's an effort to try and get your content into XML at the earliest possible opportunity. The thinking being that if you have, in the middle, a neutral digital asset that is high quality XML in a neutral format, then you can automatically, or nearly automatically, transform it into products at the push of a button. So. PDF can be produced via style sheets, as can web products and, and e-books. Um, and because the publishing industry has been so subject to change, um, there's a particular value in having a neutral asset because you never know what the market's going to, to produce next. Five years ago, it didn't seem that EPUB was going to take off, and now it's, of course, all the pub publishers are scrabbling to produce content. So the more and more of an imperative to have uh, a neutral asset that you can respond to the market with technology changes with. I said I'd talk about JATS. JATS is the standard um, for scientific, technical, medical, and engineering journal content. It stands for Journal Article Tag Suite, and it is a NISO standard uh, with that designation as well. It's only recently become a NISO standard. It had a long history before that of being developed uh, as an informal standard by a number of industry players, um, starting in, in the 90s when um, publishers got together and decided that they were spending far too much effort on having non-interoperable and disparate um, tag suites for marking up their content. Uh, with it, SGML, which was the precursor to XML, first found a uh, strong foothold in publishing, especially in STM publishing. And so there was already some experience of using uh, markup for content, but each publisher had typically gone their own way and nothing worked for anything else and they were all facing the costs of having to educate um, their suppliers to use their own particular tag suites. So with funding from Carnegie Mellon Foundation, some of the big players including Elsevier uh, and Blackwells and Wiley got together and decided to produce as compromised as it was tag suite 
that could cope with all the content that it had between them. Um, and this was evolved over several versions, and today it's used by nearly all um, STM journal publishers. And it's become a requirement uh, for types of electronic submission. So, for example, if you are a publisher and you're submitting your content to uh, an online service like uh, PubMed, you have to submit in uh, a JAX format. If you, um, in the UK, there's going to be, or is soon going to be a requirement for electronic submission of metadata for electronic articles, a copyright um, requirement, and that, will, again, will be the JAX format, will be the one that's required. It's become uh, widespread within the industry. Just a note, uh, for those interested in book publishing, there's a parallel standard called BITS, which is uh, similar in many respects, and the aim with that is to become sort of parallel for, for book publishing, uh, as JATS has for journal publishing. Okay, here's some JATS content, which for most of you will just be common or garden XML, I suppose. Um, nothing at all unusual about it. You can see that it's fairly granular. This is from the metadata at the top of an article. You can see that they split the names up into, into component parts. Uh, this particular one has um, this XREF element so they can establish links between each author and the body to which they're affiliated. Um, here, there's a link off to some extra biographical information, and so on. I mean, there's nothing at all unusual about this XML for anybody who's used to XML. But of course, publishers are not used to XML, and authors aren't used to XML either. So there's a big problem here. How do you get from the thing that the author produces, the, the manuscript and office suite, into your, your neutral digital asset? And how do you do it without adding huge expense? Um, and this has been a problem which has vexed, or had vexed the industry for, for many years since XML, HTML became established. So the first or approach that was often tried, um, particularly when programmers were in the driving seat, was to say, well, can't the author just produce the XML? Uh, and with that in mind, there was sometimes authors were encouraged to try and produce XML, or more particularly people in-house were trained to use XML editors to produce uh, JATS content. And you might imagine this is not, um, was not successful largely because of cost reasons. To train somebody up to the point where they, where they can confidently author XML content using a tool, um, and with the sort of uh, money that's around in publishing, it, it just doesn't work. And as soon as the person becomes trained up in XML, they go off to work in finance industry or something else, which is a more lucrative uh, venue for their, for their skills. And also, it requires publishers to have the sort of management skills and knowledge of XML, which is just not really within their remit. It, it's quite a specialist technical thing to have a team of people working with XML content. So apart from a few exceptional cases where, where you have um, technical teams or unusual people, it's very, very rare that uh, high-value content is originated in XML. And often, you, when you're paying an author to produce content, you're paying for their expertise in the thing that they're writing about. You're not paying for their expertise in, in wrangling with tags. So another approach was to dump the manuscripts onto an offshore conversion house, usually, where um, uh, low-cost labor, people could key it into XML. This is, this is sometimes still used. Um, the problem there is quality control and, and management. Um, it's, you, you'll be, you're taking in charge of a huge manual operation, and it's, it's quite difficult to get that running smoothly and efficiently. So automated approaches were tried as well. In fact, very early on, there was something called the glorious title of Microsoft HTML Author Add-on designed for Word 97 for Windows. Well, Microsoft, uh, HTML Author for Word, as it was sometimes called, was a, was a Microsoft-supported add-on for Word, which attempted to turn Word into an HTML authoring tool. Um, uh, it was sort of much unloved, and it's quite difficult now to find any information about it, even on the web. Um, but it attempted to constrain the way in which you could use styles, and would spit out HTML at the, at the end of the process. So again, that wasn't, though it was sort of semi-successful in some, in some venues, it never really took hold because it was clunky and, and it just wasn't a very technical solution. 
there were other other uh, tooling options that worked on, on words output, either on the, the binary files directly or on the RTS that word would emit. And again, these were these were text manipulation tools or programs that would work on the proprietary format and try and work out the patterns and turn that into XML. Again, all variably successful, and none of these things um, were, were great solutions. So this all changed and enabled a more sort of purist approach, which I'm in favor of, uh, when standards in, became prevalent in the Office suites. So as many of you know, uh, the two main standards within uh, Office formats are open document format for Office applications, brackets open document, which is more commonly called ODF, um, or by me, since I'm a standards geek, as 26300, its ISO designation. And this is a, uh, a format for describing Office documents, uh, both word processing and spreadsheet and presentation documents. And it's um, overseen within OASIS, which is a industry-led consortium. And ISO, the International Standards Organization, has a role, a sort of junior role in this case. Most of the work goes on in the OASIS consortium. ISO IEC produces a parallel version, um, which is got the ISO stamp of approval. Uh, the rival, uh, which originated from Microsoft, is called Office Open XML File Formats. Nobody ever calls it that. It tends to be called either OXML, or Microsoft people, like to call it Open XML. Um, it's ISO designation 29500. And the seniority of the standards organization is reversed in this case. All the, the real work on this takes place uh, within ISO IEC, and the consortium body ECMA has a junior role just mirroring what the international body does. Uh, they're both well, what are called free open standards, and they're both based on XML wrapped up inside a zip archive. Um, and both formats enjoy some support. Um, the Microsoft format enjoys very good support from uh, Microsoft products, obviously. As we heard this morning, LibreOffice are working on improving their support for the OXML standards. ODF has good support from the ODF suites, most famously LibreOffice and OpenOffice. Um, and Microsoft also claim to, or do, keep that open ODF uh, as well. Taggy, again. If you're used to XML, this, this sort of is just usual stuff. This is from a, an ODF document. And for those of you not used, whoops, used to, I typed "Hello World" into a into a word and saved it as an ODF document. Um, this is what comes out. You can see the word "Hello World" there. The rest is is all the sort of gubbins of a, a default ODF document. So you know, it's not for an XML developer or a developer at large. This is normal. For somebody who's not involved in that world, this is deeply scary and worrisome. Now, how do you restart this from where it was? Is it F5? No. Don't know how to drive PowerPoint. Nevertheless, the fact that we've got XML coming out now, the authoring tool changes changes the field a lot um, because the, the prospect is now open to us of being able to transform what the authors produced into our neutral asset without having to go through this nasty route of inspecting the binary file format or trying to wrangle with RTF or what have you, or offshoring. Um, but is it just a transformation task? Well, the answer is it's, it's as, as when the word just is, is, is used, it's usually much more complicated than that. Um, first of, of all, because, of course, the XML produced by the Office Suites is not the XML that you want for production. It's this awful taggy mess containing all kinds of editing information which is of no relevance to you as a, as a journal publisher. Nevertheless, the uh, principle of sufficiency, sufficiency and consistency, if your source document contains the information that you need, and your source documents are collectively marked up in a consistent way, then theoretically there is a possibility of enabling automatic transformation from those source documents to your, to your target. And the advantage here is that people working in publishing workflows are trained or are 
accustomed to being rigorous when they're working with um, textual content, when they're working with Microsoft Word. And the problem with uh, author-supplied Word is that all authors have what's called in the trade an inner typesetter, that they can't help but start fiddling with the formatting and doing all kinds of things which um, the publisher often finds troublesome. And one of the most common things that happens in publishing, we don't tell the authors this, is the first thing that the, the publisher does is to copy all of the text into a text editor, ex text editor to arrange or uh, erase all the formatting that the authors lovingly have applied because it's, it's generally useless. Um, and you come across all kinds of awful things like authors inventing their own fonts to get the effects that they want and so on. And if it can be done, authors will do it. And that, that suggests a problem because one of the sort of great things or the you know, liberating things about Office Suite word processing is that it's, it's free. You can do what you want. You can do all these wonderful things. And of course, the software vendors have a habit of putting in more and more features in each release, you know, word art or glowing text, multi-column layout, all kinds of things that are never really needed for just tapping out high-value content. Now, is it possible to envisage a workflow in which standards are everywhere? We already had standards, as I've said, established in the back end of the process and, and the middle of the process, and now we've got standards in the front end of the process. Can we complete the picture and make it standards-based all the way through? Now, it is possible to affect the transformation from your source document to um, a JATS format using macro programming, as I call it. So you could use VBA, which is the um, programming language still in Office, I believe. Um, you can use APIs or SDKs. Um, for example, you could use uh, DOM, which is a way of addressing XML in memory, which is a nasty, horrible thing I would not recommend. Or you can use native SDKs like something called the OpenOffice SDK, which enables you to manipulate content. However, I'd suggest that there's a sort of an impedance mismatch between using a programming language like that and working with XML, in that it, what you're essentially doing is manipulating the tags and the strings within it, and doing that with, with uh, Java or .NET or, uh, does seem rather clunky. So I would suggest instead using uh, standards-based declarative language to affect the transformation. The two most popular of these are XSLT and XPROC, and I'll come on to that in a second. The advantage is that this um, decouples your process from the vendor application completely. If you're using uh, VBA, you're still, although you're using standards, you're still developing a dependency on the product. Um, if you're using SDK, you're still using standards in some sense, you're developing a dependency on the SDK, which is not standard. So in some ways, uh, by moving to uh, declarative XML standards-based language, you're, you're avoiding the potential lock-in these other approaches. Um, for the implementation I'm talking about today, I, the uh, in-word customization was kept very, very light indeed. It was just uh, enough code to put a few buttons on the button bar so the vendor could launch the processes easily. And all the code underneath did was then launch processes which invoked uh, standards-based scripts. So um, uh, they would uh, shell out to call an XPROC engine in this case, which is uh, an piece of software called Calabash, which is a Java-based uh, FOSS uh, XPROC engine. Now, XPROC, how many of you have heard of XPROC? It's strange. It's, it's, uh, I would say it was the most important thing W3C has done for a long time, or with the exception of the HTML languages. It's been a recommendation of W3C since uh, 2010, so it's, it's quite uh, aged in some ways. Um, and it's a uh, pipe planning language which enables you to decompose any XML manipulation task into a series of, of small steps. And the advantage is for, for uh, lazy programmers like me is it makes it very easy to get your head around what's going on with the XML because you're, you're, each operation is a discrete thing. So I'm, I'm going to rename these elements or I'm going to um, rearrange the way that table cells work or what have you. Then the script at the end is a long series of sequences, each of which has identifiable start point and end points. You can test easily to say, has the particular step that I want it to do been achieved? Of course, there's a small performance penalty for doing things like that, but with machines these days and the sort of text we're talking about uh, for this application, that's, that's immaterial. 
Um, as I said, it's declarative XML language, so the, the programming itself is in XML, and, and there's no impedance mismatch when handling XML. All the things that you find in XML, like namespaces and elements and so on, have a natural uh, way of dealing with them within XPROC. I should also say that XPROC can incorporate other XML languages, so quite often the steps will be to call an XSLT routine, a transformation routine, um, but these tend to be quite small. So your XSLT, you have, tend to have lots of little XSLTs rather than one enormous one. Uh, and again, the advantage of that is that a large XSLT program, and for the sort of application we're talking about, it will be um, you know, many thousands of lines, gets quite hard to maintain because it's one, you know, it's one it's a very big throbbing thing which is difficult to, to debug often. So then uh, the question, uh, perhaps a religious question, comes up of ODF or OXML. Um, as I said, both uh, are viable formats for initial document, document creation. Of course, you can, you can create the sort of documents we're talking about very easily with an office application and save them. Uh, the OXML is saved by Word, better expresses some of the more advanced features I've said. For example, change tracking um, is handled well by Word. However, that's not re we're not talking about a requirement for advanced features in this particular world. Change tracking, for example, doesn't really come into play. Neither does things like word art and glowing text and all this, this weird stuff that you can do in Word. Uh, for my money, uh, ODF is less complex, uh, and so it's much easier to, 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 to handle, which means it's cheaper to handle, which means I'm a, I have a competitive advantage if I use it instead of OXML. Um, one of the reasons why this is so is that ODF has a, a model of documents which is, how should one put it, is, is tastefully in line with the way that things have always been done in XML, that things are contained within structures and everything nests down nicely into you know, paragraphs contain uh, runs, of, uh, runs of text and they contain inline things and it's all nice like that, whereas the Microsoft's uh, standard tends to be, uh, it's, not, it's not designed in that same way, it's more an XML expression of their binary file format, so it's much more um, blocks of things rather than nests of things. And that makes handling it with XML-based processes quite uh, tricky because XML-based processes tend to be XML-based in themselves and like to see nests of things. Um, another interesting feature of this is that if you're using uh, a workflow with Word at the front and you have a Word producing ODF, which you then use, you're giving your customer a, an off-ramp from, from Word. Say, okay, well, I've done this tool, and you can still keep using Word if you want to, but if you ever stopped wanting to use Word, want to do something else to produce, that produces ODF, no problem. So let's talk a little bit about the implementation. The implementation, implementation is, in fact, kept extremely simple for a publisher in this case. All they have to do to produce the metadata, for example, is to fill in a table. What could be easier, easier than that? So. On the left-hand side, you have the sort of things they have to record, and on the right-hand side, they um, put the item, you know, the article title, the keywords, author name, and there's a few conventions to help out the converter so that they have to put the surname of the author in, in bold so that the converter can do that. It's a surprisingly difficult thing to automate surname detection. But otherwise, it's just a question of producing that taggy metadata we saw earlier of the author filling in the table. That will then spit out ODF, which is similar, is similar to what you saw earlier. You'll see here that we've got um, just have a laser pointer on it. No, okay. Old-fashioned method. So you'll see that, for example, here we've got the author name P, P. Bollars. Spits out into because it's a table. You can see that all kinds of table-centric markup that's been uh, produced from uh, Word ODF format. Um, somewhere, in, somewhere within here, we'll find P bollards. Yes, there we are. So you can see there we are. P ODF has strangely text S for its spaces and bollards. And then you can imagine how the coding goes, the coding saying, because I know that there's a table which has on its right-hand cell the word author name one, and P 
two volatiles in the uh, in the right hand cell, sorry, I can then do a conversion to work that into the content I want. And sure enough, if it's the sort of converted content we'll see, if the thing's just being wrangled around and you get um, this representation of the content. And it's a, it's for XML heads it's a straightforward XML transformation. There's just quite a lot of it to do. So the result of that process is that by pushing a button, they've invoked a standard-based script, and out pops uh, a JATS conformant XML document, all being well. And then this is sent off to, uh, in this publisher's case, it's sent off to um, an online host, and then finds its way into PubMed, for example. So here's the thing as you'll find it on the web today. And you can see the bollard piece up here. And of course, that's a completely different presentation to the one the uh, publisher has in mind, but it's what PubMeds do. That's the big indexing organization in the US. And the requirement for PubMed was that the thing was sent to them in JATS format. So again, the, this interoperability between partners is enabled by the standard. Um, yeah, one of the dis disadvantages of working medical content is that you sometimes get gruesome pictures. This is not a particularly gruesome one. But uh, that same JATS content is then sent to an application for page layout as well to produce the PDF version. I have not the same article, but one here. How many of you have used or aware of something called Adobe Frame Maker? Adobe Cinderella product. Not few even know about it. It's, it's a strange, uh, it's a desktop publishing package which has the unique feature of um, being XML behind the scenes. So you, you can see here that this is um, it's a page layout application that enables the publisher to produce high quality multi-column page layout with beautiful text spacing, which they will then control between particular words to make sure it's all nice, and complex tables and graphics and so on. But behind the scenes, it's weirdly enough a complete XML editor as well, so that all the text that you're producing in page is linked all the time to the XML artifact behind it. So one of the huge um, horrible problems in um, publishing workflows like this is that human beings tend not to see errors in content until they produce see the final form. So it's often only page proofreading which, which surfaces errors. So it's always generally corrections at this stage. And having this sort of application enables people to make sure that corrections that are made to the page version find their way back into the XML properly without losing the um, synchronization between the two. Still, the, as far as I'm aware, this is the only application, that, desktop application, that does this. Little known. There are some special considerations in uh, producing this sort of content. So as I said at the beginning, this is typically known as hard content and does have some, some hard problems. Um, the, the unholy trinity of hard problems is often called table, maths, and what say special characters. Tables are particularly horrible. Um, five minutes, okay, not just because they're complicated, but you can do things in a word processor which will defeat, um, defeat attempts to present it rationally. So you can get hold of a, you can get hold of a table grid line in Microsoft Word and just drag it. And that, what does that mean? That doesn't correspond to any of the standard table models. It's very, very difficult to represent. Fortunately, um, there are standards that address all of these things. There are standards for table markup. There are standards for mathematics, MathML. And wonderfully, uh, simple maths in Word will come out as MathML if you save in ODF format. And special characters have also been dealt with by the advent of Unicode. So we don't have to worry about um, symbol fonts and nasty things like that anymore. That word, word is so Unicode-y, one of its best features, I think, is if you know the Unicode code point of a character, 3D2, for example, and type Altex, it will turn it into that Unicode code character straight there, and it's back again if you type Altex. So again, the standards, standards underpinning the format come to the rescue. MathML, the table format in ODF is a, a fairly same one, similar to HTML. And the use of Unicode means that all these previously very hard problems are now addressable without difficulty. 
I said all being well, and all, a, a JAST document will pop out of this process. Um, but of course, all is not often well because human beings will make mistakes. So one of the uh, interesting features of uh, this approach is that ODF is not just read-only format, you can write to it as well. Um, it's a requirement for the operator in the publishing doing the markup that they have to do everything very rigorously. They can't invent their own table names in a metadata table, for example. Um, they can't have an H4 heading if they haven't got an H3 heading that precedes it. All kinds of little rules like this which govern the output. A QA script examines the ODF and will modify it by inserting comments telling the operator where they've made a mistake. So here's an example of what it does. You can see that the program itself has added a comment saying, hang on, you've put a thing in a metadata table called associated societies. I don't know how to handle that. It's a problem. And this enables, because there's a feedback loop, the program can annotate the ODF and tell people where they're not being rigorous enough to make a viable document for transformation. So lessons. Um, I think what this project showed was that an entirely standards-based approach for publishing work workflows is viable. It does work. This particular workflow has been in place uh, for four years, producing this uh, publisher's output. Uh, I should say that I'm aware of similar projects in the UK which use OXML instead of ODF as the, as the format for this, so it's perfectly possible to use that if you are minded to. I think uh, if you minimize your dependency on the products by avoiding SDKs and uh, the macro languages of the products, you will further uh, minimize your potential lock-in because you're basing everything on standards, and you can then move much more easily between uh, vendors' products if you want to. As I said earlier, this, this off-ramp off option is there for people. If, they, if they're using ODF with MS Word, they want to use Word for any particular reason, it still gives them the option to move away from MS Word at some future date if they want to. Just a few final thoughts about future directions. Um, it would be nice if there were standardized templates for producing such documents. Um, if I had to invent the one that this publisher uses, everybody doing a project like this has to invent their own. Wouldn't it be nice if there were standard office document templates that produced viable uh, documents that could be transformed to a number of popular formats? Um, in ISO itself, people editing standards these days are pretty much required to use a standardized template produced by ISO itself, called ISO STS which ironically is not standard, it's a word doc, doc thing. Um, but, this is, but this is nice there because everybody has to use a template. Um, people can, authors can generally handle using templates if they can't handle XML. It would be nice to have off, a sort of risk, reduced richness setting for office, doc, office applications as well. So much within office applications is useless for people producing intellectual content that doesn't have to have multiple columns and flowing text and all this weird stuff within the Word document. Um, yet it's there and it's a temptation for abuse and it just adds no value whatsoever. Even more widely, it would be nice if there was some way of having a schemas for office styles. The styles are completely free, but often the, there are implicit rules behind styles which you can't express. If you have a um, style called document title, for example, there's an implicit rule saying probably this should only ever be used once and it should be the first thing in the document. We can't express that within the, the template. We can just say there's a style and the author's free to abuse that by using it all over the place so that things look right. Perhaps more ambitiously, it would be nice if there was support for native XML authoring within Office applications rather than having to produce this sort of external scripting to do that. But uh, that's somewhat been stunned by a, a patent troll, I4I, which uh, sued uh, Microsoft for use of OpenX, this feature within. OpenXML called Custom XML, and as a result, it was ripped out of all the Office products. Anyway, that's the presentation. There's a few links on these slides for the standards themselves, and my email address if you want to contact me. Thank you very much for listening.